Hello, I want to talk to you about the great German conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler. The reason being that Deutsche Grammophon has just issued a 34 CD set devoted to their recordings of Furtwängler, recordings made in the studio in the 1930s in wartime Germany at the old Philharmonic Hall in the 1940s and again recordings in the studio in the Titania Palace, an old cinema which was partially bombed during the war in the 19, late 1940s and the 1950s. Now what is special about uh, Fort Langler? This is the box by the way and I promise you that when you buy it the name is the right way round. For some reason I can't seem to get it the right way round on my video camera. Now what's special about Fort Wangler? Well first of all he studied Schenkerian analysis which basically related to harmonic structure so that his performances unlike a lot of other people's at the time seem to follow the flow, the harmonic flow of the music so that everything sounded incredibly natural even if it sometimes went against the specific tempo indications suggested on the score. There was always this flow, this sense that the melodic lines were going in the right direction, that the orchestration was making perfect sense, that climaxes were coming at the right time, accelerandi and decelerandi were coming at the right time. Everything sounded absolutely right. And in a world like uh, Bruckner symphonies, for example, when I first heard Bruckner's Eighth Symphony, um, I'll never forget it. It was a Foot Wangler performance. And it was almost like experiencing at dead of night uh, an alpine scene where occasionally you would get lightning behind the mountains, silhouetting the mountains against the night sky. It had this sense of power. It was almost as if Furtwängler was returning Bruckner and Beethoven and Brahms and Wagner to the world of nature that inspired the music in the first place. Uh, wonderful. And over the years, from I'd say the early 1960s, when the 10th anniversary of his birth was, of his death rather, was celebrated, I collected Fort Wangler records, whatever I could get hold of. Not everything was great, but I would say 80% of it was. And then along came the wartime recordings. Now, these, for me, pose a bit of a problem. Not that they're not exceptional. A lot of them are great. The Eroica Symphony, the Bruckner Eighth, the Bruckner Ninth, the Bruckner Fifth, uh, the Schumann Cello Concerto with uh, Tibor de Machala who was Foot Wangler's lead cellist in the Berlin Philharmonic at the time. All these are wonderful, but as a Jew, I had a problem. I was being ferried back to a time when these performances were given. I would either be out of the country because I'd be in exile, and if I was in Germany or in the occupied territories at the time, I simply wouldn't be around. I'd be in a concentration camp, or worse. So how can I reconcile myself to listening to something where I'm being ferried back, as I say, to a period that would have been impossible for me? I couldn't have listened to those record those not recordings, those live performances. I wouldn't have been in the position to. Now I hosted a program on the 50th anniversary of Fort Mangler's death for Radio 3. Uh, with Sir Richard Evans and Richard Osborne. It was a very pleasurable experience. And I did a number of interviews about Fort Wengler leading up to that programme, including Frau Elisabeth Fort Wengler, Fort Wengler's widow, who was delightful. I went to her home in Lucerne, um, and Elisabeth Schwarzkopf, Dietrich fischer Diskau, and interestingly, Daniel Barenboim. Now, Baron Boym actually played for Fort Wangler when he was a, a toddler almost, I think the age of about five. But he was a great fan and so is Zubin Mate. A lot of them used to get together in those early days when the record started uh, coming out. And I said to uh, Baron Boym at that time, I ended the interview by saying, I'd like to ask you a question from one Jew to another. And I made the point that I've just made to you about... Uh, being uh, taken back in time to a period when no Jew could possibly have listened to that, to those performances unless they were out the country.
And there was a deathly silence for about 10, 15 seconds. And he said, he, he didn't exactly change the subject, but he evaded the issue. He said, well, you know, he was conducting for the people there. He wanted to give them something. He wanted to maintain something of the high standards that have been there before the war and before all this evil came into the government and into the you know into the uh, into the way things were being done and before Jewish musicians were expelled yeah he wanted to save something which is what Fort Wrangler himself said now I thought he went out although his agent I have to say did turn to me and say I know exactly what you meant by that question Baron Boyum left and I thought this is a cop out and then I thought about it I thought okay let's imagine that Fort Wangler had left because to be absolutely honest from a purely moral standpoint I think he should have gone I think he should have left because after all other great non-Jewish German musicians did refuse to play in Nazi Germany the violinist Adolf Busch his brother Fritz Busch the conductor um, Hermann Scherken the conductor the um, Egon Petri the pianist there were loads of them so supposing he left and went to, say, America to take over the leadership of one of the great American orchestras. Oh, great and wonderful. And the end of the war came. Because let's face it, the Nazis would have replaced him. There were plenty of good German conductors, none on his plane of inspiration. But there was Hermann Abendroth, there was Karl Böhm, there was Oswald Kabasta, there was Josef Kyle, there were plenty. So nothing would have happened. Somebody else would have taken the orchestra over and people would have said, OK, Foot Wangler's left, that's the end of it. Come the end of the war and he would have seen those terrible movie films of corpses being bulldozed into mass graves and the terrible things that had happened, which I'm sure he didn't know about, not to that extent, certainly not. What would he have thought? Would he have thought, well, I'm glad I got out of there? Or would he have thought, if I'd stayed, I could have offered people a passageway through the blood-soaked thickets into the light? And that would have somehow given a bit of salvation to people who were nothing to do with that. There must have been lots of people in the orchestra and lots of people in the audience who were nothing to do with Nazism, who were not anti-Semitic and who were inspired by this music to be elevated above themselves. I'm sure that must have been true. So on balance, thinking about it again, I think that actually Daniel Barenboim was possibly right. Possibly he did do the right thing by staying, although from a purely moral point of view, as I say, it's an incredibly controversial point. One thing for sure is that these records we have from Deutsche Grammophon now offer us a level of musical inspiration that it's almost impossible to match from any other conductor before or since. They are on a truly elevated level and I can't recommend them highly enough. Thank you for watching this.